Well, here you are. Another week of Advent, another week closer to uh, Christmas. And when all these things start to pile up, which happens around this time of the year, it's easy to kind of just fall into a, a pattern and just to go from one thing to the next thing without much thought or much attention. And frankly, sometimes on this side of eternity, that's just what you've got to do <laughs> to get to the next thing. But all too often what happens is we just miss life playing out right underneath of our noses. And well, there's a lot to say about that, but one of the things is Seen as God has already taken care of everything in Jesus Christ, what are we in such a hurry for? So maybe that's just enough to, to pike your interest for what's going to come, and we'll have some time to take some deep breaths. And it's not just about calming down, but it's also about noticing what's actually going on all around you. All right? So that's what you can do, and then there'll be also some questions to get you ready, but blessings. Today's scripture comes from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 22, selected verses. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. He reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidiah, daughter of Adiah of Bozkath. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. In the eighteenth year of King Josiah, he sent Shaphan, son of Azaliah, son of Meshulam, the secretary to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to the high priest Helkiah and have him count the entire sum of money that has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the threshold have collected from the people. Let it be given into the hand of the workers who have oversight of the house of the Lord. Let them give it to the workers who are at the house of the Lord, repairing the house. The high priest Hilkiah said to Shaphan the secretary, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. When Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, he read it. Shaphan the secretary informed the king, The priest Hilkiah has given me a book. Shaphan then read it aloud to the king. When the king heard the words that were written in the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that have been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our ancestors did not obey the words of this book to do according what is written concerning us, said the king. So the priest, Hilkiah, Ahiakim, Achor, Shaphan, and Esaiah went to the prophetess Huldah, the wife of Shalom, son of Tikva, son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. She resided in Jerusalem in the second quarter, where they consulted her. She declared to them, 
Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me, thus says the Lord, I will indeed bring disaster on this place and all in its inhabitants, all the words of the book that the king has just read. Then the king directed that all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem should be gathered to him. The king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him went all the people of Judah, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord, keeping his commandments, his decrees, and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. All the people joined in the covenant. Here ends the reading. This passage we just heard is a, is a very fitting one for this time of the year, for Advent. <laughs> but this passage isn't just fitting because it tells of the righteous child king. No, this passage is fitting because, well, it's horrifying. <laughs> That's right, horrifying. Now, I know we don't usually associate the frightening with Christmas, but there is a rich tradition of Yuletide ghost stories. Uh, how about that standard, the most wonderful time of the year? You know the line. There'll be scary ghost stories and tales of the glories of Christmas is long, long ago. And this theme, the ghost story in Christmas, it's happening in that classic, isn't it? Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, the best version, of course, being the Muppets version. And it's even there in those twin modern classics, Edward Scissorhands and uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, too. And these are not anomalies, either. Before the invention of electricity on demand and HVAC, it, it was the winter that was truly the most terrifying time of the year. Uh, as the, the days grew shorter, stayed darker like this longer, and as the weather turned colder, uh, cold seemed to fall from the sky. When that happened, the world seemed to become a particularly amenable to all those things that go bump in the night. As the environment seemed to chase life away, one's mind couldn't help but turn to the odious notion that perhaps this sinister chill would increase and increase forever without any abatement. The bleak midwinter gave, it lent credence to that wretched thought that maybe, maybe the warmth of life would never return. And that harrowing thought, dear sisters and brothers, is the terror we must all confront today. Oh sure, we may know all about the Earth's axis. <laughs> we might reassure ourselves with uh, the principle of spring's inevitability. But methinks we doth protest too much. After all, the powers and, principa princ the powers and principalities, they haven't been all that reliable lately, have they? And disturbingly, this same thing plays out on an individual level, too. Sure, humankind may muddle through by the skin of our teeth. We often have. But that doesn't mean each one of us, you and me, are not facing the very same menace. Now, I don't mean that life may break you down either, although life does have a way of putting your back against the wall, doesn't it? But no, I am talking about the existential undoing. I am talking about the numbing of the soul and the freezing of the spirit. This is the true peril we all face. It is not, a, it is not merely a theoretical possibility that we may sleepwalk our ways through life, is it? And neither is the prospect that we could stop living before we die. A spirit can perish. You can plod your way, your, your way through this life physically alive, but actually dead inside. And even more dreadfully, this can happen with faith too. We can become so far removed from the all-consuming fire that is our God that the flame in our soul goes out. And should that happen, faith will sour. Belief will become a curse and religion will cease to comfort too. 
The knowledge of God's existence is not enough by itself. This information is only a burden, and it is a terrible one at that. Now I know, <laughs> I know you might be tuning into this service to get a little reprieve from all these threats I just spent uh, so long talking about, and I get it. But hear me out, because first of all, we need words to describe our quandaries. This is why the first step in getting better is the diagnosis, naming the ailment. This is also what's behind God giving Adam and Eve dominion over the animals by allowing them to name them. When, when you can identify something, you gain a little control over it. But that's not all either. The, the calamities of life by themselves they are not what's so distressing, are they? No, what's, what's really painful about those times when life goes sideways is the fear that we are the only one. What's really gut-wrenching is that awful notion that the real problem is that there's something really wrong with us and us alone. This, by the way, is why Luther knew that the absolute worst thing you can do is hole up by yourself when the devil is throwing life in your face. Luther learned the hard way that, that when, when you're in the tight corner, when you're in the tight corner, you can't get out by yourself. And in fact, trying to only makes the pinch that much more crushing, that much more crushing. No, what you need to do when life goes off the rails is get yourself in the company of others. This solace was such a balm to Luther that he nearly considered it a sacrament, <laughs> The, the mutual consolation of the saints, Luther called this all-purpose Christian cure. And this remedy is so effective for a couple of reasons. First, first you'll learn that it's a lie that you are the only one. When you talk about what's giving you trouble, you will discover to your great relief that they can relate. And knowing that you are not in this alone is huge. Don't underestimate it. Don't underestimate it. And just so you know where to turn, you're not bothering me when you reach out to me to do my job. <laughs> you're not bothering me when you say, can we meet, Pastor? So don't hesitate to reach out. And just so you know, in our congregation, we've got all these wonderful Stephen ministers too. And Stephen ministers are people who have been trained to listen lovingly, and it's all anonymous too. So you can always schedule an appointment with one of our Stephen ministers. Most importantly, though, when you talk about whatever has got you all twisted up, you will also get wise to the, to the fact that God has something to say about it all, too. The real crisis is the fear that we are cursed, isn't it? What's really alarming about the tough times is the horrible thought that God has abandoned us to them. So hear this loud and clear. Christ has filled every last nook and cranny of existence with himself. What's more, on account of the cross, those places that appear most God-forsaken are actually most God-blessed. When you feel furthest from God, God in Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, draws closest to you. This is why Jesus could say something like, blessed are the poor in spirit. So when, not if, when, when life gets on top of you, come here. <laughs> here. This is a place for real sinners, not imaginary saints. <laughs> but it's not just that we're all in this together, although we are. No, you can come here with all your misfortunes because faith is not the denial of disaster. No, faith is the hope in the face of disaster. Let me say that again. Faith is not the denial of disaster. Faith is the hope in the face of it. After all, isn't that what was going on in today's scripture? When the long hidden book of the law is rediscovered, poor Josiah learns that it is too late for him, that there is nothing to be done, that the sins of the past will catch up with Josiah and the rest of the people too. And yet, and yet, and yet, Josiah seems to be doesn't seem to be deterred in the slightest. Our passage didn't include this part, but after the covenant ceremony, Josiah goes through with it all. He, he tears down the idols and he builds the temple back up again. 
Apparently, although there was nothing to be done about their fate, there was plenty to be done about absolutely everything else. Josiah reforms the nation knowing full well it won't make any difference. He does it all without any hope of reward. For Josiah, faith is its own recompense. And for this, Josiah is numbered as one of the greatest kings of Israel. He is right up there with King David, and as he should be too, shouldn't he? The temptation, of course, is to say you ought to emulate Josiah. And of course you should. We all should. It's called faith for heaven's sake, not bartering. In any way, we would be a lot happier too. It's rarely the outcome that is so upsetting to us. No, what's really bothersome is how this or that didn't turn out the way we expected it, how we thought it should. Letting go of the outcome is freeing. It was never in our hands anyway. Relinquishing the results allows you to accept life on its own terms and it opens the possibility of doing something just because it is right not expedient or easy. And that's a huge thing in life. But it's not just as easy as all that, is it? Or is it? Or is it? (laughs) Really, the only reason we hedge our bets is because we think we still have time left to maneuver. But what if I told you you don't? (laughs) What if I told you it's already too late for you? What then? Now, I understand it is still the first half of Advent, and one of the conceits of this season is that it is all about preparing for God's arrival in Christ. And that's all well and good. On account of Christ's eternal uh, eternal incarnation, it is altogether right and salutary that we would take this time to prepare for the crowning of the year. It will happen. However, however, you are sorely mistaken if you think Advent is time to get ready. (laughs) First of all, it is too late for us. I don't know if you've checked lately, but the mortality rate is still 100%. None of us get out of this alive. And what's more, there's nothing you and I can do about it either. We are doomed. On account of our original sin, like Josiah, we too live under the ancient curse. Some of you, though, don't need me, don't need me telling you that, do you? No, life has already gotten out of hand for you. Uh, You already know all too well that it is all too late. Like Luther, you have learned the hard way that there's nothing you can do. But since you already know that, let me tell you something you may not know. Blessed are you. Yes, blessed are you. Blessed are you who are harboring no more illusions. Because now you are living in reality. And reality is God's staging ground. As we like to say around here, Reality, true spirituality is life where? (laughs) I just said it. Reality, true spirituality is life in reality. But you know what else? That is not the only reason it is too late for you and me. The plain truth is you cannot brace yourself for the reality bursting incarnation. Heaven cannot hold him, nor the earth sustain. Heaven and earth shall flee away when he comes to reign. You don't prepare yourself for something like that, do you? No, you don't. No, you don't. And even if you could, and you can't, but even if you could, even if you could, it is still too late. It has already happened. And I'm not just talking about some Sunday in the year 1 BC either. No, I'm talking about time immemorial itself. Christ is the firstborn of all creation. His nativity has been knit into the very foundation of the universe. When Mary gave birth to the Christ child, She conceived the very conceiver of existence itself. Yeah, wrap your mind around that. Try and prepare for that, I dare you. But I'm not going to hold my breath. (laughs) I'm not going to hold my breath. But now at long last, another question presents itself, doesn't it? A wholly new question. And this is a question that would never occur to you so long as you were foolishly trying to manage your own fate. And it's a pretty darn sweet question, too. Now that you know deep in your bones that it's already too late for you, you're finally free to ask Josiah's great question. Now what? Now what? (laughs) Now what? What are you going to do now that it is already too late for you? What are you going to do now that there's nothing you have to do anymore? Now what? Really, now what? Now that you don't have to worry about yourself, you can finally begin to realize just how much everything else matters. 
Reality itself is happening right underneath your nose right now. The stakes of salvation are playing out in real time and it is all happening right here and right now. Wherever you are on the other side of this recording, it is happening. And now you can finally start to take it all in. The adventure of Advent awaits you and you are only limited by your own lack of imagination. Now what? Now what? It is, it is too late for you and me. We can't save ourselves in any way. We never needed to either. It has always been a matter of now what? Now what? Don't go and think this doesn't matter either. Yes, salvation is in the bag, but you, you are on the line. Christ is not about to lose a single one of us. He won't lose you, but will you lose yourself? Will you get to eternity having never really lived or loved? And it's not just you either. The very world hangs on what we say and do and fail to do and say too. But I don't mean that we will save the world. It is too late for any of that nonsense. No, what I mean is that the world has already been saved. But how will they know if no one tells them? The only secret of the church is that the church knows something about the world that the world doesn't know about itself. Namely, that it is loved from all eternity and back again. What you and I do matters, beloved. Just listen to the news if you don't believe me. We are tearing ourselves apart trying to find something to believe in, aren't we? And terrifyingly, the cruel oppressor wants us to succumb to this despair. This, this is the real horror facing each one of us today. The cruel oppressor wishes that you and I would believe that this is all just a bunch of whistling in the dark and that we are not up for it and that we are too small. The hordes of devils wish, desire that we should shrink back from their swarm. And it would be easy to, too, wouldn't it? It is a small thing, this little word we cling to. And I hate to tell you, but the darkness is not just about to shrug and walk away either. No, the gloom will increase. <laughs> The war may be over, but the specter, the sore loser, still does as much collateral damage, still does as much collateral damage for the time being. Yes, we will light candles in Advent. Compared to the encroaching nightfall, though, they will seem so small. But as St. John the Evangelist declares in his Christmas story, the light shineth in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not, not. The foes fear the word of God for one little word subdues them. This Advent and the very first Sunday thereof, a champion comes to fight. You ask who this may be? The Lord of hosts is he. And host is a military term, by the way. The Lord of hosts, Christ Jesus, mighty Lord, God's only son adored. He, he holds the field victorious, victorious. It is already over. It is too late. For now, it is a matter of waiting, stealing ourselves up for what has already been accomplished. Now what? Now what? Fellow wayfarers, hope is not nothing, and neither is waiting. In all truth, they are really the most radical actions you and I can ever take, this Advent or any other day. No, these gestures will not make all the difference. Christ has already done that in his cross-shaped way. But for now, but for now they do make this, the interlude, that much more melodious. And on this side of time everlasting, that is nothing short of a miracle. These actions we take right now, they seem so small. But they are truly the most powerful and most faithful actions you and I can ever take. <laughs> On account of Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the beginning and the end incarnate, this all breaks in right now. And you, you have a part. And so, there'll be a little bit of time for a solo, a prayer, you and God. Later on, there'll be a time for praise, too. Christ has accomplished it all for you. Now what?
and now. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint heart. Support the, the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And indeed, that's just what we'll do. Rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us sing together. and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. And all of God's children say, Amen. Amen. Well, as far as announcements go, you know, I want to make sure to mention our Christmas Eve services here at Faith Lutheran on Sunnyside at 4 and 7 p.m. Uh, during this time of Advent leading up to Christmas, we have a Wednesday evening prayer service that's sung. It only takes about 30 minutes. It's called Vespers, and the service we do is hold an evening prayer, and that is on Wednesday nights here at 6.30 p.m. And beforehand, we have a book group that's meeting, and we're reading uh, Auden's poem for the time being, a Christmas oratorio, and that starts at 5.30 if you want to join us. And we got confirmation going on, and we're taking up a collection for families with... Um, with uh, community action here in town. So if you want to get involved in any of that, and there's other stuff going on, and a good way to find out about that is to check out our webpage. You can also uh, find us on, on social media too. You can also give us a call, send us an email, um, shoot us a message. We could be in touch that way. And of course, joining us here for Sunday morning worship, which is at Sunday at 10 a.m. So all of that and, and more, and we've, we've I love to mix it up with you in Christ's embrace over there, you know, it's uh, the more the merrier in him. All right then, so now gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right, then. Well, now, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.